going out to the beach. That water does something to me, man. It makes me feel good. Freedom makes Joseph Sledge feel good, too. He spent nearly four decades in prison for a crime he didn't commit. In 1978, a judge sentenced Sledge to two life sentences for a double homicide. Do you remember where you were and what you were doing back then? Think about all that's happened since 1978, the development of personal computers, the internet, and mobile phones. Can you imagine spending all that time, nearly four decades, here in a prison cell for a crime you didn't commit? Joseph Sledge can because he did. We go in the neighborhood where I, where I grew up at. It's two and a half weeks after a three-judge panel declared Joseph Sledge innocent and freed him from prison. This is the house I grew up in and went through elementary school all the way to the, uh, to the, to the seventh grade. Sledge is back in his boyhood home of Savannah, Georgia. My eighth grade school teacher lived right in that house right there. He's taking us on a tour of his old neighborhood. I spent my growing up days going to the swimming pool. I love the water. Sledge says he and his siblings had a good childhood. We stayed on the beach all the time, stayed in the water. Sledge and his sister say their father would take them crabbing and fishing in the tidal creeks near the Savannah River. We had good times, good life. After he graduated from high school in 1965, Sledge was drafted into the Army. He drove a supply truck at Fort Bragg. After leaving the Army, Sledge moved around to various cities for work. He eventually returned to Fayetteville, but struggled financially. In 1973, police arrested him for larceny and receiving stolen goods. A judge sentenced him to four years in prison. He was at White Lake Prison Camp in Bladen County when another inmate hit him in the head, fracturing his skull. I said, well, I ain't gonna chance myself being around a guy, you know, with, with violent behavior or whatever, so I left. Left, meaning he escaped. On September 5th, 1976, Sledge hopped the fence and made his way through the woods towards Elizabethtown. He stole a car from a nearby house and drove to Fayetteville. A policeman spotted him a day later, but Sledge got away. Police arrested him the next day in Dillon, South Carolina. But Sledge already knew he was a suspect in a far more serious crime than escape, the murders of two women just north of Elizabethtown. Two women in the sanctity of their own home were brutally stabbed to death, perhaps even sexually assaulted. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a case that certainly shocked the conscience of the investigators handling it and, and rocked the community to its core. The two women were 74-year-old Josephine Davis and her 57-year-old daughter Aileen. They lived in this small wood-framed house between Elizabethtown and White Lake Prison Camp. They were murdered the morning after Sledge escaped. In Joseph's case, you had two uh, women murdered four miles from a prison where someone had just escaped the day before. Case closed. Sledge cooperated with investigators, hoping to prove his innocence. He showed them his escape route. He showed them where he hid his prison clothes and other clothes he had taken from clotheslines along the way. Investigators collected evidence at the crime scene, including bloody fingerprints, palm prints, and shoe prints. They also found hairs on one of the victims that appeared to be African-American. But the coincidence of his escape from a nearby prison just hours before the murders made Sledge an obvious suspect and seemed to drive the investigation. Chris Muma is the executive director of the North Carolina Center on Actual Innocence. She says investigators had tunnel vision focusing on Sledge. And I think he should have been a suspect. I think it made sense for them to look at him. The problem was uh, they didn't look beyond him. But Bladen County District Attorney John David points out that it was more than a year before Sledge was charged with the murders. And during that time, a number of credible leads were developed against a host of suspects, and I don't think that the, the, uh, the investigators necessarily had tunnel vision. But their leads went nowhere. Investigators didn't have enough evidence to charge Sledge. Public pressure for an arrest reached a boiling point while racism simmered under the surface. In that area of the state, there's tremendous racial tensions then, and I think still now. You got a white woman dead. You got a black man's hair on him. What you gonna think? And the family was very vocal. The family kept the pressure on. They kept checking in to see what was happening and wanted resolution. 
So did a community that had seen more than a dozen escapes from White Lake Prison Camp and a half dozen unsolved murders that year. Investigators began looking for new leads. They admit that they went to the prison looking for informants to help them convict Joseph. Law enforcement really is at the bottom of the barrel when they go to other criminals and say, can you help us with this? In November 1977, investigators sought help from White Lake Prison Camp inmate Donald Sutton, who said Sledge claimed innocence in the murders. In December, Governor Jim Hunt doubled the state's reward in the case to $5,000. In February of 1978, investigators interviewed Sutton a fourth time. He then said Sledge incriminated himself. Another inmate, Henry Baker, told investigators Sledge admitted to the killings. Authorities finally charged Sledge with the murders. It wasn't about let's do process and let's investigate and let's look at other options. It was it was a done deal. Um, black perpetrator, black escapee, case closed. Sledge's first trial in May of 1978 ended with a mistrial. They didn't have the evidence. You know, it was conjecture, it was a guess as to whether or not he was the man. The district attorney didn't want to retry the case, but his young assistant, Mike Easley, did. Easley prosecuted Sledge in a new trial just three months later. It was moved from Bladen to Columbus County. Easley's case relied heavily on the two jailhouse snitches, Sutton and Baker. That was their case. I mean, that, that was terribly important. And this time, their testimony implicating Sledge was much more detailed. The testimony of the snitches was so much altered and changed the second time around from the first time around, you just have to assume there was more discussion about it or elaboration about it or something. You know, if you have one informant, then people might say, well, I'm not sure. But if you have two informants, they're like, well, they couldn't get two people to lie on the stand. It was powerful evidence. So was expert testimony that the Harris found on the victim's body bore microscopic similarities to sledges. Another expert also suggested that there may have been blood on the driver's seat of the car that Sledge stole. But Sledge's attorney says the pivotal moment came when the judge allowed the jury to see pictures of the victims after their bodies had been exhumed for a second autopsy. Right then, that case was lost on that second. The second the, ju the judge said, yeah, that's okay. Let the jury see the pictures of those people down in that coffin like that. The jury convicted Sledge, and the judge sentenced him to two life sentences. There was no uh, physical evidence presented to prove this case. Next, the evidence Joseph Sledge's attorney and the jury never saw at his trial. The prosecution even either knew all the evidence that was being hidden, and they're corrupt, or they didn't know and are completely incompetent. In May of 1979, Reunited was the number one hit single. A crisis of confidence. Jimmy Carter was president, and the North Carolina Supreme Court denied Joseph Sledge's appeal of his murder conviction. Over the next 13 years while he was in prison, Sledge filed more than 25 motions to state and federal courts proclaiming his innocence. It's another indication that man felt that he was wrongly convicted. I mean, he wasn't going to let it die because he felt like he uh, was not guilty of it. In 1993, Sledge wrote a letter to the Columbus County Clerk of Court asking for DNA testing of the blood and hair evidence in his case. People who were in prison who knew DNA might save their lives uh, had much more faith in DNA in 1993 than the courts did. Sledge sat in prison for another 10 years before a judge ordered DNA testing of the physical evidence. Affidavits were filled out that said both from the Columbus County Clerk's Office as well as the Bladen County Sheriff's Office that they conducted a, a search in their departments for this physical evidence and were unable to, to locate that evidence. There were searches that were conducted, it's just that they weren't thorough. People don't want to believe that someone's been wrongfully convicted, so they do a cursory search and say, yeah, I did what, what, what I'm required to do and I'm not going to put forth any more effort. I could have been freed years ago. I could have been freed. In 2004, the North Carolina Center for Actual Innocence began investigating Sledge's case. It wasn't until 2012 that it located most of the important physical evidence, including the hairs used to help convict Sledge. The Columbus County Clerk of Court found them in an envelope on the top shelf of the evidence vault in her office. My heart started racing and I said, don't open it, uh, just 
package it up and, and I will send you information on where to send it. DNA testing of the hair showed they did not belong to Sledge. I wasn't surprised because I believed he was innocent. Just a few months later, Herman Baker, the only surviving jailhouse snitch, recanted his trial testimony, saying it was all a lie. In May of 2013, Sledge's case went before the North Carolina Innocence Inquiry Commission. The commission poured over all of the recovered evidence and did more testing. At a commission hearing a year and a half later, the case against Sledge unraveled in public. What did you say about the murder? What I was told to say. <laughs> what you were told to say? Yes. Mm -hmm. Evidence shows the jailhouse snitches collected the reward money and had some criminal charges against them dropped. So freedom and money, those are, those are big motivators. The Innocence Investigation uncovered evidence never presented to Sledge's attorney or to the jury at his trial. And it left little question in my mind that a wrong man was, was charged with this heinous offense. This, of course, is the case of State of North Carolina versus Joseph Sledge, Jr. By the time Sledge's case was heard by a three-judge panel in January, his innocence was clear. There was no proof of blood in the stolen car. The footprints found in and around the house were not his. All those treads came from the same pair of shoes and they were not Joseph's, and that was known before trial. So was the fact that the bloody palm prints and fingerprints were not Sledge's either. They have all these fingerprints inside the house in the blood, not a single one of them. I mean, there was a bunch of them in that house. Uh, none of them were Sledge's. The prosecution even either knew all the evidence that was being hidden and they're corrupt, or they didn't know and are completely incompetent. The only physical evidence presented at Sledge's trial didn't connect him to the crime either. Have any of the hairs that were found on the body of Aileen Davis matched Mr. Sledge? None of them. Based on what I now know that there is compelling evidence of actual innocence. In his closing argument, District Attorney John David, who was a child when the Davis murders occurred, said Sledge was the victim of a criminal justice system subject to human error. Let me just be the first on behalf of the state of North Carolina to apologize to Mr. Sledge for that. In her closing argument, Muma said the system prosecutors like David defend is clearly broken. The defense and Mr. Sledge truly regret, truly regret, that the family of Josephine and Aileen Davis were not given the justice they deserved. But when an innocent man or innocent person is convicted for a crime they did not commit, the number of victims grows exponentially to include the wrongfully convicted, their family, their community, and the justice system as a whole. The unanimous decision of the, of the three judge panel of the Superior Court judges. At 70 years Superior old and after judges. spending more than 37 exactly. years in prison for a crime he didn't commit, the exactly. judges finally declared Joseph Sledge experience. innocent. It is further ordered that Joseph Sledge Jr. be immediately released from custody. The Honorable Court of the General Court of Justice is now adjourned. Sign our die. I absolutely believe he was framed. I think he was a discardable African-American male who was in prison for larceny and had no value. We reached out to the lead investigators in the case. One didn't respond, the other wouldn't do an interview. Neither would Mike Easley, the prosecutor who won Sledge's conviction. Easley, of course, went on to become a two-term state attorney general and two-term governor. Next, an update on Joseph Sledge, who is back home catching up with his family in Savannah, Georgia. And back in Bladen County, the investigation of the Davis murders is reopened as a nearly 40-year-old cold case. We now have a DNA profile of the person who we believe is responsible for this incident. The murders of Josephine and Aileen Davis were a tragedy. The wrongful conviction of Joseph Sledge only made it worse for the Davis family. Any sense of closure in their case is actually a sham. The only person who wins when there is a wrongful conviction is the actual perpetrator. David says he has reopened the case and will use the DNA and other physical evidence to find that perpetrator. We're going to work hard uh, to try to develop suspects moving forward, but our challenges are, are definitely steep. I hope the whole family and Josephine and Aileen received the justice they deserve. So does the Davis family. We the family are heartbroken by this decision and we the remaining family members are shocked by the, this change 
and are compelled to ask the community for help in finding the persons or persons responsible for this heinous crime. The Davis family believed Sledge was guilty of the crime until the very end of the innocence investigation. Throughout that process, they refused to do interviews with the news media. And Donald Hales, the grandson of Josephine Davis, even assaulted our photographer Jay Jennings while Jennings was shooting this documentary in Bladen County. It was an indication of the tension and anger that still exists nearly 40 years after the Davis murders. Yeah. Well, I can thank God to be alive and, and thank the Innocent Project and the Innocent Commission for sticking by this case and, and making it really happen. Thank God for that. The day he was released from prison, Sledge told his lawyer, Chris Muma, that the first thing he wanted was a bowl of oyster stew. Carry me to this place and, and, and I ate some oyster stew. Yeah, it was stew down good too. I enjoyed myself. Yes, sir. I have some raw oysters for yes, you. Mom. Enjoy. There's yeah. homemade thank, thank you uh, very much. horseradish in there for you. Oh, yes. Sledge yes, is yes. still enjoying oysters back home in Savannah. I always dream of a day like this. I always dreamt of a day, and it finally came true. Sure enough, really and truly, patience, prayer, and perseverance. Yeah. That's the truth. He's also catching up with siblings he hasn't seen in 40 years. He wouldn't let them visit him in prison. He didn't want nobody to come see him like that. Because I beg and beg, could we come see him? He said, no. I don't want y'all to see me like that. Dear sister, I hope everyone is well. I want you all to say a prayer for me to get out of prison. Sledge stayed in touch with his sister and brothers by writing letters. He missed family weddings, births, funerals, and holidays. Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's. Don't you think that was nice, wonderful things to celebrate? He wasn't there for none of them for the past 38 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But he will be here this year for everything. And that's a blessing. I'd accumulate so many friends in prison as though that, that, that I left my family in prison. <laughs> His sister is glad to have him back, but upset at what happened to her brother. Ah, uh, you got a lot of evil people in the world, but I didn't know it was that evil, you know? How could you take somebody's life away and set them up? and give him, he did 38 years, but y'all left him in there to die, you know? Say he would never get out, but God is good. That's right. Come on, y'all, you can do it, you can do it. Sledge's brother Edward is glad to have him back too. Didn't you say I got a lot to learn? They've seen each other nearly every day since his release. <laughs> So, oh man, I'm so happy for him right now. You know, I really stick together every day now. And talk to you, make sure you don't go nowhere now. Stay with me. I said, just stay with me back where you can. Got this phone because it's simpler to use than this one. The day after he got out of prison in January, Sledge bought his first mobile phone, two of them in fact. He bought a flip phone to use until he could figure out his smartphone. I can call here in New York in a matter of seconds. I mean, it took minutes and minutes to get communication. Sometimes you couldn't get a connect. Edward, coming by the house, man. But now he comes to you like that, like I'm talking to you. Here. Oh, it's amazing. I can go on the internet and buy stuff and, and have it, I have it on my doorstep in a couple of days. That's amazing to see what man has done, invented since 40 years later. His first two months out, Sledge used his siblings in public transportation to get around Savannah. But in April, he got his driver's license and bought a car. I just had to re-establish um, re my um, abilities to drive. Next is finding his own place to live. Sledge had been staying with siblings since his release. I think I can manage, yeah. He shows no anger or bitterness over what happened to him. You know, you can't hold yourself in contempt about matters that you have no control over. The state will pay Sledge $750,000 for his nearly four decades in prison. He also plans a lawsuit against the state and local agencies involved in his conviction.
but no amount of money can buy back his lost time. Just give me 40 years back. <laughs>